Hello, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful holiday weekend. I'm Mike Good of Together in This, and I'll be your host today. I'd like to welcome you to the Together in This show, where we have conversations to empower people who are fighting back against dementia. Today, we're in for a great show because I've got Ellen Belk, who will be sharing tips and strategies to help you start implementing a holistic approach to care that will provide balance and reduce your strain. When you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's or another dementia, it's important to maintain a caregiving routine that is beneficial for both you and the care receiver. Ellen Belk has over 13 years of dementia care advocacy and is a recognized industry professional providing holistic dementia care solutions. She is president of Keep in Mind Incorporated and the creator of Memory Mags, Memory Mills, and Fitness with Friends. Ellen leverages her unique background in broadcast media with her notable dementia care success to bring holistic dementia care solutions to you. Welcome, Ellen. I just, uh, again, a million apologies for everybody. Hey, hey we're all dementia caregivers, so we're, we're very used to pivoting and ebbing and flowing when something doesn't go our way. I'm sure everybody can appreciate that. So thank you for being so gracious, and thanks to Mike for inviting me to be on this together in this. And I guess what I'd like us to do is just get started because we've wasted some precious minutes. So thanks for hanging in there, everybody. And Mike, I'd like us to start with the slides if that's okay. So just, okay, to, make that's sure, just to make sure that you all are aware of where you are, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to put the title slide up so that you, if you thought this was uh, a Martha Stewart living program, then you're painfully the wrong place. So, Today we're going to talk about the holistic approaches to dementia care, my version of them, and, and how they have impact, a high impact for both the caregiver and the care receiver. So we can go to the next slide. As, as Mike indicated, I'm the president of, Keep, of a company that we smartly thought, we thought we were very smart when we came up with this name, Keep in Mind. Uh, we specialize in holistic dementia care solutions, some of which you'll get a, a taste of today, and caregiving resources. Uh, I want to be very clear when I talk about this. This is a, a, I got a couple of housekeeping slides up front in that although uh, we realize that, um, that individuals absolutely can benefit from medication when they have a dementia diagnosis, I'm not here uh, trying to, to say that medication is not valuable. However, I wholeheartedly believe that everybody benefits from a holistic approach to care. So I want that, that's just the place of where I'm coming from. And, it, and it's very simple. The things we'll talk about today are very easy to incorporate into your caregiving practices. And again, as we, as we move through this presentation, you'll see how it can benefit both you as the caregiver uh, in, in how you're delivering care, and then of course the receiver is always benefited when we have a holistic uh, approach. Next slide. Just to be clear, this is again a disclaimer that I, I give to every, every presentation, just so everyone is very clear. I'm not a physician, I'm not a nurse. I am Ellen Belt, who's not even a member of the medical community. So all the, the holistic information and ideas that I'll share with you all today are from 14 years of experience in the field. And then unfortunately, most notably, uh, the last three years, I'm an adult child providing dementia care to my father. We're in, we're in year three of our journey. And everything, literally everything that I will talk about today, we are having amazing success with my father as we uh, keep him successful in his, in his home with my mother, who's his wife of 62 years. So I just, uh, these are, uh, take that for what it is. Everything that you'll see today, some of it you might be able to say, this is what we already do. Uh, other things might be new to you, but if anything it sounds too avant-garde to you, which is not my intention, I would then of course encourage you to consult your physician before you change anything that you're already doing. Okay, next slide. So who is Ellen Belk? I told you what I am not. I, I told you that I'm not a physician and I'm not a nurse, but this is just a very, we'll get through this quickly. I, I entered the industry as I shared with you before. This is my 14th year. I come in from, from an activity position. I have worked at every level there is in care, from an activity director in a skilled nursing center. I've been a director of adult day services. I'm a very, very giant proponent of adult day. Uh, that is something that I would love to know if, if anybody on this call is using adult day services and if you've got any successes with that. That is a wonderful way to help our, our loved ones with dementia stay independent in their own home by having that respite for the caregiver when our loved one attends adult day. My father 
attend the adult day. Uh, I've been a, a director um, a, in a community, a continuing care retirement community. And then my last professional position, which is really was the impetus to why I began my own company, in my last role, I spent three years as a divisional director to a very major uh, industry leader in the, in the senior living industry. And in that position, I oversaw 24 memory care communities that were in 11 different states. So I was responsible for, responsible for helping us to kind of remain compliant. My communities were everywhere from Texas all the way through Kentucky and, uh, and Virginia and all the way out to the East Coast in New Jersey, Philadelphia, and even into, um, into Baltimore. And it was in that time period of my life, doing that particular work, where I really started to realize that we had some significant gaps in the industry that I was not aligning with very well and that I, I just felt that we were making the same mistakes over and over. Whatever part of the country I was in, I was seeing a lot of the same mistakes happening and I felt that it was time for me to break away from the herd, if you will, and start a company with my holistic vision and see, you know, and bring this, my ideas to the marketplace to see if it benefits those that are like-minded like me. So that's, that's kind of how I come to be in front of you today. Next slide. So when I talk about holistic, and uh, I've been very thoughtful in how we put together, keep in mind, and what we stand for. When I'm talking about holistic and what we will be discussing on this call today, are these are my four pillars of philosophy. I'm not going to push certain supplements. I am not a person that's going to talk to you about coconut oil. Uh, that's not the type of holistic care that, that I work with for family and professionals. Um, my holistic solutions that I will be sharing some of today with you focus on these four pillars. What is our caregiving environment? Are we setting ourselves up for success? Um, that's a huge, huge critical component in, in where we even are delivering the care. If our environment is um, not setting us up for success, we, we have a greater opportunity to fail, unfortunately, as caregivers. And of course, both in our care, they struggle mightily when our environment has significant glitches. And so that's a very, very big part of my philosophy, how we manage the environment. Communication, I frequently ask people, do you speak dementia? Uh, it's a question that is powerful because it is, it's a learned skill. And it, not everybody speaks dementia effectively. And then, of course, I'm a big believer in making sure that we're getting nutrient-dense food and using food as a holistic way to, again, um, to, to, to help deliver quality care and activity engagement. I will tell you all on this call that I actually spend, I can do this, this presentation can be an entire half day, and it has been that. For the purpose of time and for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to focus mainly on environment and nutrition. So that's, that's where we go. And we'll, so to start with, we're going to go to the next slide and we're going to dive right into the environment. What is what we want to do, what I challenge all family caregivers uh, and professional caregivers is we want to create a safe, dementia-friendly environment. The first slide talks a little bit about you know, in a home setting. And I just want to stop for a second and, and interject this. I play college basketball, which of course, this is a sidebar for those of us that know that tonight is the final NCAA game. Uh, I play basketball in Wisconsin, not at the University of Wisconsin who's playing tonight, but I I played at Marquette University, so you'll have to forgive me. I use a lot of sports analogies in my training and, and when I work with caregivers because I approach dementia care very much like a team sport, if you will. I think it takes a team to deliver good quality care, and, and for even for those of you that are caring alone, who you feel like you're doing the lion's share of the care because you're by yourself with your loved one, I still challenge you, and I will talk about the importance of how it absolutely takes Team to deliver championship level care. So I want to use this analogy. With that being said, I want to say this. So I told you I played college basketball. When we play basketball, you play in a, on a basketball court, which is a flat surface with a hoop on either end of the court, and you can bounce the ball up and down the court and you throw it into the hoop, and it goes into the hoop, hopefully. And the person with the most points at the end of the game wins. We, we do not play basketball on a soccer field, and there's a very good reason for that. We, we would not be able to be successful playing basketball on a soccer field. So 
that's the environment that we must, to be successful playing basketball, we need to play in a proper basketball environment. So that's how I uh, make that analogy because it's no different. If you're trying to provide championship level dementia care in your home, we need that home to be the proper environment that helps you be successful and then, of course, most importantly, the success of those in your care. So what does that look like? These couple of bullet points, I won't read every single one in the essence of time, but I, I'll, the first one is a, is a key. So often, those of us in a home setting, we have, a, and I, and I and we take great pride in how we decorate our homes, but too often, we have a lot of loose area rugs that are incredibly dangerous for aging bodies in general, but of course for our friends with dementia. Because think about it, if you, if you're a caregiver currently, which I'm sure most, most of you are, um, you sometimes we notice it, even before we notice the cognitive decline, we start to notice a shuffle gait emerges. That's a very it's very common in aging bodies in general, but it also is indicative of the dementia journey. Uh, I, do, I do notice that that happened in our situation with my dad. Probably months before we started to really notice the cognitive decline, we were starting to notice a difference in how he walked. Well, if you've got layered rugs, and a layered rug is carpeting with area rugs on top of it. Yes, from a de design perspective, I'm sure it's very beautiful, but from a successful dementia environment perspective, not so beautiful. So I challenge everybody to really do an assessment of your living environment and to eliminate things that are going to make you unsuccessful in care. We want our walkways clear. We, want, we don't want obstacles in the way. As our, as our loved ones with dementia are already struggling with what's happening in their brain, we don't want to add insult to injury, and literally injury, by, by forcing them to navigate around items that are in the home that will impede their successful movement. Um, our, the sleeping area is another area that I, I focus on, especially in a home environment. We want to make sure that it's easy for our person to get in and out of bed. As many of us know, that as the you know, again, as we age in general, but those of us with caring for some of the level of dementia, there's probably several opportunities that they get up and out of bed throughout the night for various reasons. Whether it's to use the restroom or they're having issues with their day night, you know, with day night disorientation and they're not sure that they're supposed to stay in bed. So again, we want to make sure when those moments happen, they have a free and easy access to get up safely and out of that bed and out the door or, or to the bathroom without any hindrances in their way. Um, I also am a big proponent of having a safe outdoor area. That is hugely important. I'm a big proponent of that in a professional setting, which we'll talk about in a second. But for those of us that are caring for our loved ones in our home, it's, it's really critical that we give them a change of scenery, a change of pace, and that outdoor space also needs to have as much attention to detail and lack of clutter and safe, smooth surfaces so that the outdoor movement is safe as well. I'm a big fan, we've, we've done it very successfully in our home with my father, to have night lights and, and motion lights that, again, that help, help safe movement in, in the evening hours. And, and again, this will be a very big key that we'll talk about in, in upcoming slides as well. I, am, I really challenge all of you, those of us that do not have cognitive decline, we take it for granted all the ambient noises that are in our environment. It, think about it for yourself. Is it uncommon for you to have the TV on or the radio on while you're talking on the telephone, and then maybe uh, and then maybe the, the microwave bell is going off? That to us, we get used to that. But for a person with a cognitive decline who's just struggling to hang on day in and day out, all of those that ambient noise is very very distracting. So again, it's a, it's a critical part of creating a, a friendly and safe dementia environment is being very, very vigilant about making, maintaining, uh, uh, minimizing, I should say, the distractions and noise that happen in the environment. Next slide. Let's just switch. I'm not sure how many of uh, those of you are on the line that are professionals. And most of my conversation today will be about um, family caregiving. But just, just in the event that I've got some professionals on the line, uh, again, if you pay attention to your uh, your environment, your care environment, some things you can't help because the building was built that way. Unfortunately, up only until in the last probably five to ten years, we've really spent a lot more time in new construction on, on minimizing the harsh overhead lighting that was so indicative from 
years and years and years in a dementia care setting. And that is, listen, ladies, we know that we don't look good in, in fluorescent lighting, uh, but harsh fluorescent lighting is a good from a dementia care perspective because of the, the harshness of it. It can it, it, it can impact the, uh, the, the visualization issues that are also happening as the as the disease journey progresses, and of course, it also can create shadows. And I'm going to talk more about why it's critical that we try to minimize the shadows in our in our caregiving space. Another thing uh, that I uh, it's a it's big one of the first things that usually happens to me with my professional clients. I'll get a phone call and they'll say, Helen, we've got several residents that are you know just they're acting out, they're they're aggressive towards each other. We absolutely can't figure out what's going on here. Please come here and help us. So I jump on a plane, I get to their building, and the and I walk into the environment, and oh my goodness, I'm here. And staff talking across the halls with each other. Uh, there's a TV on. There's beepers going off. There's, you know, um, maybe some music playing as well. And I and I say to the staff, seriously, and you're, and I'm going crazy. And and I and I don't have dementia, as far as I know. So again, especially in a professional setting, we can do a much better job paying attention to maintaining a calm and nurturing, uh, a nurturing atmosphere. I'm also, just as a little sidebar, again, I told you I came, come from a, a creative, uh, an activity background, rather, that last bullet point, I'm a big believer, big, big believer from, a, from an environmental perspective that we give residents in a professional setting multiple opportunities to engage. I am not a fan where we have 35 residents all sitting in a giant circle engaging in some sort of activity. Smaller, more intimate, personalized activity, what we call parallel programming, is, is, is highly encouraged in the professional setting, um, where three, four people might be doing a puzzle with an aid, while another part of the room or another part of the space, five or six people are doing a very customized art, art project, and then maybe in another part of the building, six or eight or ten people are participating in a music program. Again, you want things to be more, more personalized in our professional care settings for certain. And that's a great way to maintain a good environment. Next slide. So what I'm doing here is I told you three years ago, literally it was March 25th, I will never forget the day, I got the phone call that no child wants to get from their mother who had told me that she was in the emergency room with my father because he had fallen in, in the bathroom and they, as a precaution, had gone to the emergency room because uh, that's what people do, thinking that that's what you should do. But unfortunately, that March 25th, 2012 trip to the to the uh, emergency room where my father walked into the ER on his own two legs and told the emergency room personnel that he had fallen getting off the toilet in his bathroom and he was shaken up a little bit and he was very able to articulate the situation. That that uh, moment in time, if you will, started our family on a on a third at that time it was a 36 day journey through hospitalization, uh, HE double toothpick. <laughs> it was a hospitalization hell that now three years later we've gotten a handle on and my father now, we are uh, we have a mixed dementia diagnosis of both Lewy body and Parkinson's. So much like probably many of you on this call, uh, we try to avoid the emergency rooms and hospitalization in general as much as possible as we are family caregivers. Uh, we, those of us that have had those experiences, we know all too well uh, they are not dementia friendly. So that being said, this is my, uh, we bring, of course we were mercifully able to bring my father home after 36 days. Uh, and of course, once we got him detoxed off all the medications that he had been given, uh, we, we started to see our, our, my dad come back to life again. And this is a picture of their family room. This is not what this room looked like before my dad went to the hospital. Sadly. My mom and dad, my mom is my dad's primary caregiver. They've been married uh, 62 years. And there was a beautiful, she was very proud of the bear rug that was in the middle of this space. After my parents both retired, they had done a lot of traveling. And in their travels, they purchased this art piece that was actually a rug on the floor. And it was a sad day. It was a hard, it was a hard conversation to have with my mom that we were going to have to pull that rug up. That memory, that beautiful memory that she had with my dad was going to have to be put into a closet because what was best for my dad now was that he has a smooth surface to, to ambulate around this space. As you can see, 
the two the two green chairs on the right side of your of your screen, the one that has the extra cushion, that's my dad's chair. It gives him a little extra stability, and, and those arms are solid arms. He's able to stand and sit on his own from that chair. Subsequently, if you look to the left side of the screen, there's another hardback you know, chair with arms that you can see on the left side, lower left side of your screen. There used to be a rocking chair there. But again, as we, were tr as we are now making this a dementia-friendly space for my dad to be successful, we removed that rocking chair because that's not a safe piece of equipment, if you will, or a piece of furniture for somebody who's got uh, stability issues. And we've replaced it with a nice sit back chair that uh, has those arms that he can, again, use his whole body weight to stand to go from a seat to stand position and then, of course, from a stand to seat. Next slide. This is another example. This is the hallway that is. My parents live in a condominium in Wisconsin. And this is the doorway. There's, you know, this is how you enter their condominium. Again, also in this on this floor, there had been a, a beautiful long runner. It was very pretty. Uh, it had a rubberized back. It did. However, it was it was a low pile rug. It wasn't as um, the pile was flat. It wasn't as you know hazardous as the bare rug that had been in the room preceding this. But I still encouraged my mom to pull it up at, because this is the entrance of the home, and my father is in and out of the door quite frequently. He's a uh, he. He exercises quite rapidly, and so he goes out that door to go for his walk outside and in the halls of the condo. So we pulled that rug up, and of course, we added another hard sit back chair with arms here in the corner so that he has a resting spot to take off his shoes or just to, to, to sit if, it, if, he, if he pushed it a little too hard and he needs a, a place to manipulate. So I encourage all family caregivers, and of course, those in professional settings, we need extra chairs. We need uh, tools and to help our, our friends, our loved ones with dementia to be successful. Uh, and notice that there's minimal clutter. There's not a lot of, uh, there's not piles of anything. He doesn't, he has a straight pathway in the front door uh, and then if he would turn the corner to go into the front so, Next slide. This is a picture of the, the bedroom that my father had to sleep in when he first came home. It's probably for about a year and a half actually. It's only been in the last year that he's been able to transition back into the master bedroom. Uh, where my mom sleeps, although we have been in separate beds for his, for his, for both of their success. Actually, uh, that is something I, you know, I can get into further. But this, for the first year and a half that he was home, uh, this is that was his bed. Again, as you can see, we've made a clear pathway. He, if he were to stand up out of that bed and walk towards us on this, that's how he would get out the door. There used to be a, a dresser drawer on that white wall next to the, um, the door that you can see, but that's a closet. Uh, there was a, a dresser drawer there, and at first, when he came home from the hospital, we had not removed that yet. My dad now needs to walk with a walker, and of course, he gets up about two or three times a night, and so uh, it, it took me only a day to figure out that we needed to remove that uh, dresser drawer. Again, we wanted no reason for him to have to step around anything in the middle of the night, and there's already increased confusion anyway. And as I mentioned, maybe I didn't, my father has a mixed dementia diagnosis of Lewy body and Parkinson. And for those of us that are caring for someone with a Lewy body dementia diagnosis, you know that hallucinations are a, a, a byproduct of that particular form of dementia. My dad does have those. And so again, having a big hard object that is that you know could be in, in his way as he's trying to navigate in the overnight, he just wanted to eliminate all of them. So this is a, he was very successful. And then I'm, and I'm proud to, I'm proud to say that. So this is us creating a safe, holistic, you know, dementia environment for my family. Next slide. So why does it matter? Why am I making such a big deal about all this? You know, um, if, if you've ever heard the saying, you know, you, met, you meet one person with dementia, you literally met one person with dementia. Absolutely everybody is unique in their disease journey. But there are some similarities that, that do cross uh, party lines, if you will. And think about it. If you're, if, think, I always, I frequently ask when I'm doing staff and, and family training, I try to get those of us that are providing the care to put yourself in the place of those you are caring for. It's hard enough for them to navigate their day as all of this stuff is happening between their ears, inside their brain. So it, it, it's critical. Why, why do I say? Eliminate excessive background noise and try not to have overlapping sounds. 
because we're trying to set them up to win the Super Bowl. You're trying, we're trying to set you up to win the Super Bowl of dementia care, and we want the, the person that you're caring for to be the MVP of the team. So for that to happen, we need them to be successful. So by eliminating the noises that already are, that, that can cause a lot of conflict in their brain, again, it, it's just it's so, so very, it's so very important. We need to give them half a fighting chance as they struggle to maintain clear thoughts. Uh, we also think about also, again, you know who you're caring for. It's not uncommon uh, for us to, as bodies age in general, not only is dementia something that you're battling against, but think about it. Do they have visual limitations to the cataracts? Have they, uh, you know, is their eyesight compromised? Do they, you know, is there glaucoma? We already know that depth perception is a, a definite uh, byproduct of most dementia, is dementia in time. You know, you might, have, you might have issues with depth perception several months or years before I have depth perception, but we do know that that is a common uh, characteristic. So again, because of all that, that will in, impede how they navigate through the space. So to set them up to succeed, which is what we're trying to do by eliminating tiles and books on the floor or you know trinkets, lots of trinkets on top of things. We don't want we don't want to confuse the living space with a lot of stuff that is difficult for them to see, possibly difficult for them to understand what it is. Uh, we don't want them tripping over things. So again, we're, it's more than just the dementia that we have to worry about. It's all the other layers and levels of decline that happen uh, with, our, with our visualization, our hearing, and other, other things that happen as we age combined with the dementia. Um, okay, so next slide. Well, that, that as, I, as I indicated, literally I could do an entire day on the environment. That was the kind of the quick and down and dirty of maintaining and why it's important to maintain the environment of the entire space that you're living, that you're living to carry in. Not going to shift gears and talk about meal time. Uh, this is something that is, is true to my heart because I, it, it is something that we've had great success with with my dad as we peel back all of the medications, many of which were unnecessary for him, and we've got a great, great team of doctors in place now that, that support our vision for our dad, which is to have a minim minimal amount of medication. I want, again, another thing about my dad in particular, those of you who are caring for someone with a Lewy body dementia, it is also a very common benchmark that people with a Lewy body have uh, had significant adverse reactions, or can, can have significant adverse reactions to medication. My father is the poster child of that. So we, uh, we have had uh, to really be very, very sensitive, and it's always, I always encourage, from a medication perspective, and as advocates, we need to be loud and proud with this. If, if you are experimenting with medications, which of course is definitely part of um, it works very well for many people. It's always advised to start with the lowest dose possible, so that you start with the baseline, and then as, as needs change, you can increase. But when doctors go straight to high doses, it is something that I challenge and I encourage, and I, I try to lift up caregivers. Use your voice and, and, and understand that sometimes that's impacting your loved one negatively, and uh, and we have a right as advocates for those that we love to, to use our voice and speak up. And until we do that, nothing will change. So um, I just, that's my little sidebar PSA. But so, so as things happen, mealtime meal as caregivers, and I noticed this with my mom, you know, and those of you that are caring full time, 365 days of the year, you are doing the work of five people. Often what happens in a caregiving, especially in the home setting, is that the first place that you start to cut corners is in the food delivery. It's easier to go through a drive through because you're exhausted. It's easier to order a takeout because you're exhausted and you just want to get a meal on the table. Well, I, um, I challenge you to try desperately not to do that because it's so critical that, especially with all aging bodies, but for our friends with dementia, there's a, 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 there's a pretty well-known fact, especially for those of you who have a loved one with an Alzheimer's diagnosis, which is about 70%, 65 to 70% of all dementia still happens to be at the Alzheimer's site. That, those people 
need an additional 1,500 calories a day to maintain a healthy weight. So think about that. If you've got now, I mean, they're at a healthy weight to begin with, um, and they need an additional 1,500 calories to maintain a healthy weight. So, uh, and weight loss tends to happen in general as body age, but for you to for you to be giving 1,500 additional calories to your loved one to maintain a healthy weight, that has to be nutrient dense calories. It can't be high fat, high saturated uh, fats, and and things that are void of nutrients. So I, again, it's, it's, I challenge you to, to, we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies as to how you can, with some simple tweaks, you can make sure that you're delivering, um, you know, delivering nutritious meals that are helping you, both you, it's good for you if you're eating the food along with your loved one, but it's helping your loved one remain successful. Understand this as well, that often medication uh, can, can change how a person, you know, tastes food. Our taste buds change in general as we age, and sometimes medications have a, a side effect where it, it, it'll, it'll change how you taste food. So again, what we do and how we prepare the food is crystal, so that, that the person eating the food has, you know, they're enjoying it and they're tasting it. As uh, some of you know, as you go through, well, you might start to see some swallowing issues. Again, it doesn't mean we have to change it means we have to change the food and how we're presenting it. It doesn't mean that we they have to only eat, you know, uh, they can only eat out of a straw or they can only eat, you know, bland mashed potatoes. There are things that you can do to, to make minor tweaks that help um, to keep people successful at mealtime. Again, I'm back to that third bullet point from the bottom. Avoiding noise and distractions during mealtime especially. If you, if you don't clear out noise from any other part of your living environment, but if you at least make mealtime uh, quiet and calm, or if music in a professional setting, I'm all about having soft, gentle, instrumental music playing in the background during mealtime, if that's something that your residents can handle. And you say to me, Ellen, well, why, why instrumental? Often, and I've seen this, I've seen it firsthand, often, again, depending on the journey, everybody's going through it very different, but if you have music that's recognizable, during mealtime, there are residents, or there are people in general here in the home setting, that will be distracted by the music because they recognize it and they start to sing along and they, they lose their focus. So again, I, uh, if you do, if you prefer to have some sort of background music playing during mealtime, I challenge you to make it instrumental. And the last thing is, is as the dementia progresses, as the journey, as your loved one is moving through the journey, the food options need to be adjusted as well, and we're going to talk about what that looks like. So let's go to the next one. I'm, going to, I'm just going to come up for air in a second. I'm going to give you all a second to read that, the words on the left the next side of the screen. Take a moment and digest that. Fresh, fresh, fresh is best. And again, uh, I, uh, you're all saying to me, well, Ellen, that's easier said than done. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that, you know, the, the fresher the food, I, there's a great saying, I almost use it in the slide, there's a great saying, if the food has a commercial, it's probably not the best food to eat. And I love that because, uh, you know, remember back in the day when we were getting our fresh food from the garden in our backyard or the farm, that, you know, the meat and the milk from the farm animals that, we, we, that people lived on, that, that you know, the, the, the shortest distance from field to fork is really what all people should be paying attention to. But again, as we're trying to create a championship level care environment, we certainly want our loved ones to get their, their um, all, the, all the benefits of nutrients and vitamins and minerals from the food. So we want less trans fat. We want more fruits and vegetables. Whole grains. Again, healthy for the head, excuse me, healthy for the heart is healthy for the head. Uh, people say, well, Ellen, we, you know, we need salt to, to flavor the food. I challenge you to start using uh, additional herbs like dill and chives from, if you, if you don't have herbs, it, like here, here where I live with my husband and I, we have herbs in our, in herbs, potters, plant herbs rather on our back. back. I, use, I use herbs to cook every single night. Um, it's easy because I go out into my backyard. But if you don't, obviously, we can still use herbs in jars from spice places that can help us season the food and, again, in a much more helpful way. 
thing is if I don't say things wrong. I also want to point this out. I am a perfect example. Uh, we are doing this with my father. Uh, adding uh, two to three prunes to his daily diet has absolutely helped his bowel support. Uh, not only is a high a diet high in fiber good for bowel support, think about this. If you are a person caring for someone with dementia and they go two or three days without a healthy bowel movement, think about that. If that happens in your life before that for the person that you in your care, have, not having a bowel movement can absolutely work against you as a caregiver as well. It makes, obviously it makes the person who hasn't had a bowel movement highly uncomfortable physically. They feel more bloated, they're uncomfortable, they're, they're feeling pains in their tummy. Well, subsequently then, they may start to have uh, reactions. It might come out, they might have more aggressive behavior. That is simply because they are constipated. So again, it, by increasing their fiber intake from the food that they eat will help them have a more successful uh, bowel support, which ultimately makes the caregiving easier because, again, you're not battling against that, that dynamic. It seems very simple, but I, I, I have watched that play out across this country, that we keep people uh, on regiments where they are moving their bowels on a regular basis, and, and it's amazing that then the aggressiveness that can be a byproduct of a different constipated person with dementia, those can be minimized greatly. Next slide, please. Again, I love this slide. Color is key. Again, you know, many of you know, obviously know about the Mediterranean, um, the Mediterranean diet that we hear talked about so often. I'm, I, again, I'm, everything that's in the Mediterranean diet, you're trying to get rich color, the brighter, the brighter the color, the better for for the nutrients and the vitamins and the minerals that you're trying to get out of, out of your food. Next slide. Okay. This is actually a real life picture that I took. I made this picture of water and this is in my parents' home. I am a giant believer in um, using fresh fruit, fresh uh, herbs to, to, to flavor water. We must not forget the food. Again, if you look at this slide, number one, dehydration, the, de the risk of dehydration just absolutely increases as we age in general. Think about this, whether you have, uh, you know, your grandmas or your grandparents, one of the things that your parents age, whether they have dementia or not, we can all attest to the fact, what do they stop doing? They stop drinking, they don't want that extra cup of coffee, they don't want that last glass of whatever, because why? They don't want to have to run to the restroom all the time. Well, that is a complete fallacy, actually, because if you train your body to, to, if you keep your body hydrated consistently and over a long period of time, your body adjusts to that and you actually don't go to the restroom as much as possible. I swear to God, there's not an elder that will believe me when I say that, but it is true. Uh, however, so, but so again, the other thing from a dementia perspective is when we have uh, aging bodies that are on different medications that often med interactions cause unnatural dehydration in an aging body, number one. And, but number two, when there is dehydration, there is an increase of confusion. So you don't want to, again, if sometimes, literally sometimes, we have people that are healthy one day and then the next day that they're showing an increase in confusion. And it's somebody that doesn't have a dementia diagnosis, but they all of a sudden are showing, you know, significant spikes in confusion and work finding. And when they go to the doctor, we find out that they're dehydrated. We hydrate them, and then all of a sudden they bounce back. That's basically what we call a reversible dementia. Uh, it, it, dehydration can really, really wreak havoc in all bodies, but especially aging bodies, and for certain aging bodies with a dementia diagnosis. So please maintain a robust hydration schedule. Uh, I, every time I'm with my parents, I make these types of pictures. I put it in clear glass because it's prettier to look at. So as I'm pouring this for my dad, he's not as resistant because it kind of looks fun and it, and it tastes better. I will tell you uh, my favorite, uh, as I talk about supporting bowel health in conjunction with not forgetting your fluid, one of my favorite mixtures is, uh, is water, obviously, with lemon. Lemon juice, I squeeze the lemon juice in there, and then I even drop a couple of rinds in there just so that they can float around and we can continue to get the flavor that seeps out of the, the lemon rind. Lemon, 
mint, if you have access to mint, leave mint, sprigs of mint in the water, and then chunks of cucumber. Mint, lemon, and cucumber. Like, mint, lemon, and cucumber. Not only is it fabulously refreshing, but it's also, it also helps support, um, you know, bowel health as well because the lemon is a natural diet. So, again, I encourage you to experiment. I've done uh, lemons and lime water. Again, it's a way to keep the hydration with not a lot of sugar. I'm trying to get people to avoid high fructose and sugary drinks, which do you no benefit at all, and they don't even really help with the hydration. Next slide, please. Now I'm just going to show you another, a couple of pictures. This is actually a, a picture of a snack platter that I put together. Uh, again, you're saying to me, well, Ellen, it's impossible. I don't have time to, to you know, to get good foods in, into my level. Well, well, here you go. This took me all of 37 seconds. I've got crackers on the right side of the plate. That is red pepper hummus. I'm a big fan of hummus. Again, if those of you that are nutrition-minded, you know that hummus is packed with a lot of uh, minerals and it, it's healthy, fatty, good, good fat for a hummus. It's highly encouraged. On the left side, those crackers on the left side of the plate, uh, it's a low-sodium, low low-fat, creamy peanut butter. My dad likes peanut butter. I put both their almonds, as again, we all know that we follow the Mediterranean diet philosophy that almonds are a good source of, um, of you know, protein and vitamins as well. This, what I do is those are unsalted and, and just raw almonds. My dad's able to still eat that. And then, of course, I put some some fresh grapes in a, in a bowl. Notice again how that's easy for him to grab. Uh, he can reach his hands into the to the various bowls, and that is just, he's able to manage all of this by himself. This is all eaten with his hands. No utensils necessary. Next slide, please. Um, this this is for my professionals in the in the room. Although I'm, if you, and this is a very text heavy. And I apologize, and in the essence of time, I won't read every single thing because like we're going to leave some time here for questions. But the main, the main thing to take away on this one, again, it's a little redundant with the keeping the quiet diamond. But that top, the top bullet point, it, I, I encourage everybody, wherever you're providing care, to leave space between the food items on the plate that you're serving, the meal. Again, as we talked about the visual impairment that tends to also coincide and really happen as we age, and then on top of it, you're piling on the dementia diagnosis, which again makes things confusing. When you leave, when you have no space on the plate, and your chicken and your garlic mashed potatoes are all running into each other on a white plate, it's very challenging for our friends with dementia to be able to discern between the items on the plate. So sometimes I have absolutely witnessed this in a professional setting for sure. I'm very vigilant about this in our in my father's setting, so it's not happening with my dad. But in a professional setting, I personally have worked with the, with the culinary staff to, to help the residents be successful by not putting such ginormous portions on the plate that all then run into each other. Sometimes you'll see a resident just sitting at their dining, at the dining table staring at their plate, and maybe it's not necessarily that they're not hungry, it's that they can't discern what's on the plate, and they absolutely don't know where to begin and where to start. So we need to, to help them be successful by giving them visual cues and leaving space on the plate. Next slide, slide please. And now we're, we're just about ready to wrap up. And, and again, I, I scratched the surface here. And, and uh, what these are pictures of, one thing that you need to know, I encourage all of you to check um, out my website. I give, I'll give the address in just a second. Uh, what I have done, because I'm so much of a believer of letting people maintain their independence in their home setting through we want their you know just with my dad we're trying to keep him successful at home for as long as possible and so much of that is predicated on the food that he's consuming. I have offered a free so a free resource on our website we call it memory meals. Uh, for you come to my website, you put your email address in there and every other month I give recipes. I you get the I talk you through the recipe, there's pictures, there's video, and it's five ingredients or less. Because I appreciate the challenge that the home caregivers have, but I, I, I do know that it's possible to make a quick, simple meal with five ingredients or less. It's good for you, so it's, well, it's not labor intense, but it's also nutritiously sound for those in your care. And all of these three pictures are examples of that. The upper left corner, what you'll see is I'm a big fan of one-pot meals. 
All everything on this slide I have served my own father. He goes back for seconds and thirds every single time. That meal on the on the left is actually a uh, uh, brought all that's in that is ham, red potatoes, broccoli, and a couple of packets of ranch uh, ranch dressing. And that's it. That's a, that's a three four ingredient recipe. And my mom makes it probably now twice a month for my dad. It's a one pot meal for you cooking it, and then we're able to serve it in a bowl with a large spoon, and, and he's able to navigate that very easily. Uh, as you'll see, I use colored dishware in every single picture. Studies have shown that a lot of people have done studies on um, on colored plate, colored dishware, have absolutely have shown to increase a person's appetite by uh, 25 to 35 percent. So we encourage that a colored dishware, um, so that again you give your person a fighting chance. And the picture on the lower right hand side, my father and, and is able to still use both our uh, spoons, the large spoons, and, and we serve him that, but sometimes people say, oh, my husband and wife or wife doesn't know how to use knives and forks anymore, and, and everybody throws up their arms in disgust, and they, they only give them, you know, chicken fingers. Well, there are other, there's steps along the way, and with those, those utensils on the bottom right hand, you don't have to work in a professional setting to get your hands on them. Those are modified utensils with wider grips. As you can see, the one on the right is especially for people with the Parkinson's dementia who shake. Uh, who have, uh, you know, wrist, uh, possibly are shaking while they're trying to eat, and that's a wider grip handle with a curved, uh, a curve, as you can see, the curve. Again, we're trying to give them the opportunity to remain successful for as long as possible. Uh, next one. Well, that's it for me. I wanted to make sure we have a few opportunities, a few moments to have some um, questions if there are any. But again, I, I ask you to visit my website. I've got the, the 60 seconds, all of these things are free. The memory meals, as I indicated, is a free resource that you're more than welcome to sign up for. And every other month, I just sent out the March recipe last uh, week. And so if you sign up, anyone who signs up today, I'll send you the March one. And then every other month, you'll get more. But keep in mind, the kid Q&A, a, a, you can see that on my website. Every, every so often, I, I interview people in the industry who tell us about their services. It's just me. I ask them five questions. I'm just trying to give caregivers a quick idea of what your options are uh, for services and, 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 and products and things like that. And then the 60 second solution is you can primarily find that on our YouTube page. I encourage you to find us on YouTube if your internet savvy. And that is literally me giving tips like I've done today, but in a 60 second form. So that's all I've got for the group today, Mike. Wow, that was great, Ellen. That was uh, really a lot of information in a short period of time. I, um, I'm happy for that. I'm just I'm also happy I don't have that echo right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that got us off to a little a little rough start there, at least on my end. <laughs> so please um, feel free to you know inject some questions via the chat if um, if you've got them. We've we've got a few minutes left here and um, kind of got a quiet audience today, but um, you do have, if, if over there on the right hand side, if you didn't hear in the beginning, because um, I've popped in a couple of things that may cover it up, but you can re click on the chat tab to bring you over where you can type in your questions. And um, we love to hear from you. If not, just feel free to reach out to us after the show. Um, again, go to Alan's website, keep in mind, and, um, and she can definitely provide you some guidance there. And then um, also, so um, well, so thank you very much, Ellen, for the, all that information here on the Together in this show, where we're going to continue to have conversations to empower people who are fighting back against dementia. I got to take a peek and see if we got any questions. Still no questions, but um, so um, it really there's, sounds. Maybe there's nobody out there. <laughs> no, nah, there, we got we got some people. We, we got, you know, we didn't. I didn't scare them all away in the beginning. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, one thing I, you know, with dementia, that focusing on all the different areas and trying to keep balance is a real struggle, obviously. And um, but when you when you neglect those er other areas, you get more more issues. And then that that's just a, as everyone on the line knows, it's just a, a circle that you want to try to get out of and and you right. know fall on this on this holistic approach where you can focus on multiple areas um, 
makes sense. And um, it's not easy, of course, and we all know that, but some of those things like in the, the home and changing, moving chairs around or getting the right chair and just keeping an eye on on what's going on and, you know, trying to play detective and, and keeping, keeping your behavioral log log book going to try to try to get to the root cause of some of the issues is key and um, I mean I've heard everything from people having the, the porta potty in the living room where it was in sight in, in, in the line of sight of the loved one so that loved one kept wanting thinking she needed to use the restroom yeah. while they had the, you know they had the porta potty there for for convenience so you know it was simply just moving it out of her eyesight line of sight. Yeah. And getting it out of her mind, then it was still convenient, but it wasn't like tripping or triggering her to think she had to use the restroom. And yeah. um, sometimes, sometimes it's those little things. And um, so, please make sure you, um, you you know go over to Ellen's sites and uh, site I mean, and um, check out her memory meals and sign up for some of that great information. And um, I'm going to share um, if you you did not sign up in the beginning and you would like to um, know about or be informed about future upcoming empowerment shows, um, I'm going to put that on the screen also here just so you can go click over and um, go just sign, click that yellow tab there and then you can go sign up and um, that way you won't miss out on upcoming events. And, um, you know, so keep your eyes open for that. And um, so thank you. You're welcome, Lolita and Carol. And um, so, sorry about the sound. Not ever really getting figured out there. We'll, we'll keep making it, working on making improvements to get that fixed. And um, I hope everybody learned a lot. And I uh, hope you all have a great day. And if you're rooting for um, one of those basketball teams today, I hope you win. So thanks, everybody, and have an empowered day.